Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. Some interesting new camera angles for everybody. <laughs> Very uh, exciting. Crystal, what do we have in the show today? Um, so we've got Orrin Cass on. He's going to talk about the future for the GOP. We have Zed Jelani on to break down some new research about who the real shy Trump voters actually were, which is really fascinating. We've got a fantastic panel. Rachel Bovard and Brianna Joy Gray are going to join us to talk about the future for the Democratic Party and how the Biden administration is already shaping up. You'll be very very excited about some of the names that are being <laughs> tossed around. Um, but we want to start with, listen, over the weekend, became official every major network calling the presidential right. race for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. There we go. So Joe Biden spoke a little bit on Saturday night. That was the day that they called the election. The Associated Press, who we go by, and everybody else calling the election. Important to note, the president has not conceded yet, and it looks like we're going to have legal challenges all the way up until the Electoral College meets in mid-December. So yeah, have fun at Thanksgiving, everybody. Um, but before we get to that, Joe Biden spoke on Saturday night with a, you know, trying to present a unifying message Let's take a listen to what he said. I pledge to be a president who seeks not to divide, but unify. Who, who doesn't see red states and blue states, only sees the United States. And work with all my heart, with the confidence of the whole people, to win the confidence of all of you. Very anodyne speech, Crystal, very much like Obama 08 energy with in a Joe Biden body of 2020. <laughs> Just well, makes it even more exciting. Like, I don't want to dunk too much. I thought it was good. Like, Look, he, I thought he and Kamala standard, you know. both did yeah. well. Yeah. It's very consistent with the message that he's had throughout his whole campaign. It was, you know, decency mm -hmm. and kindness and unity and lots of sort of, you know, vague sentiments rather than specific no, policy. Policy. promises whatsoever but i mean again look this is who people voted for this was the message right. they voted for and i think there are a lot of people we saw van jones and others weeping openly <laughs> when the news um broke a lot of people feel a lot of comfort in the end of the trump era which is really what this is all about more than people affirmatively yeah. selecting joe can you Biden imagine weeping tears of joe for joe or uh, tears of tears joy. of joe yeah tears of joy for <laughs> joe biden i just i mean can you imagine how lame you have to be as an individual for doing that but look okay I'm glad Van's happy. You know, God bless him. Yes. Apparently, makes him a better parent. I wish um, I, I wish I felt the way that these people. I really do. Like, I wish I could go back to that time when I really felt that way about the Democratic yes. Party. But anyway, that ship has sailed. That's right. I mean, I think the key we need to focus on, and this is this is the thing. A lot of the news right now is going to be Trump not conceding. You know, Biden planning his transition team. He announces. COVID-19 task force and all of that. I think that's great. But look, we just had a titanic election. There's a lot to be learned here. These aren't polls, yeah. these are real data and real facts. And the more that we see these voting patterns, we see a something that has completely validated so many of the things that we've talked about here on the show yeah. and which the media has completely been derelict in telling their viewers about how the dynamics of this race have changed. We have some CNN exit poll data, which is just stunning. And it shows, Crystal, that the group which Trump performed the worst among was white men, specifically white, white non-college educated men, men <laughs> aka white working class men. He did got gains with everybody else. It's yeah. just amazing. I mean, I what I love about this election, yeah. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in my radar, but I kind of wanted everyone to lose, and that's kind <laughs> of what happened. Oh, yeah. Um, but it just true. ruins everyone's narrative. Yeah. Right. So this idea that demographics are destiny and the coalition of the ascendant is just going to keep marching relentlessly into the Democratic Party camp. Not so whatsoever. Biden saw erosions among black women, among black men, among Latino men. He pretty much held steady. Again, this is according to CNN exits among Latina women, mm -hmm. um, pretty much held steady among white women. But white men is where Joe Biden picked up Huge. the most support. And as you point out, white non-college men in particular. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're watching this show, this won't be a huge surprise to you because the promises that Donald Trump made to white non-college men, especially industrial Midwest, yep. he did not come through on those. I mean, he his biggest accomplishment is a corporate tax cut, the Foxconn mess, the Youngstown, Lordstown mess, all of that. 
He did not govern the way that he promised. But if you're watching mainstream media, you would think that non-college men were just part of a cult, that you could never change their minds, that they weren't worth reaching out to, that they weren't worth appealing to, that they weren't worth listening to, that they were just relentlessly all racist, and yes. so it is what it is. This blows up that narrative, and then, of course, it blows up the Democrats' you know, assumption that voters of color should just be in their camp no matter what, and that they don't really have to do anything to win them over. The Latino men gap is incredible, really. Clinton won by plus 31, Biden plus 25. Clint, Latino women, Clinton 44, Biden 42. Black men, Clinton 69, Biden 62. Black women, Clinton 90, Biden 83. I mean, on every single racial minority group, Joe, Bi uh, Joe Biden underperformed Hillary Clinton, except the only, except for white men. I mean, that's one of the parts, again, which nobody is telling you. And it, again, destroys so many different narratives and other things that were presented by the media. It was like, oh, he's doubling down on white men and white male grievance. Well, like, how did that work out? I mean, just, it didn't work out so well, did just it? Just think about this yeah. one piece, which is that Kamala Harris was put on the ticket yes. expressly for the idea that you could not only hold the margins that Hillary Clinton had with minority voters, but actually improve them. And instead, they saw erosions across the board and actually picked up support. Yes, actually, with what they white really men. did is pick up these college educated whites, not even that much in the aggregate, but in specific states. That's who they owe this whole victory to. It very much validates what we talked about here. The Atlanta suburbs are what delivered Georgia for Biden, the Michigan, Philadelphia. Trump actually outperformed his vote in the minor city of Philadelphia and the minority area, same in Boston and all across the country. But those suburban voters in the main line of Philly, they saved Joe Biden's candidacy, came out in massive droves. Same Although thing I, in Detroit. I, I do think, I think that's yeah. important, but I also do think that the non-college white men story is incredibly significant. Oh, because 100%. when you're talking about the narrow margins that we saw in Wisconsin, in Michigan, yeah. in Pennsylvania, you know, that eating into that margin so that Donald Trump was not winning them as overwhelmingly as he did last time around was key to Joe Biden being able to hang on in those three states. No question. If Trump just turns out what he turned out in 2016, he wins the election. All three of those true. different states. That's All true. three, even with the Biden gains amongst college educated whites, but it didn't matter. And I think that Derek Thompson over at, at the Atlantic, somebody I admire, admire very much, yeah. he has some new analysis. Let's throw this up there on the screen, which is that the chief divide in American politics is now college education. It's basically the diploma divide. He points out that there are 14 states with above average college attainment, and Democrats won all 13 except Utah, which of course, not only majority white, heavily Mormon. And amongst those counties with at least 30% college attainment, Democrats increased their share by 90%, a two to one margin there, a win counties with large college edutainment. We have another tweet there, really interesting, let's throw this up there, which is that before the election, Democrats won in cities and Republicans in rural areas, but now look at the distribution in the urban-rural gap, which largely you can also analogize to education levels with lo lower educated people living more in rural communities, highly educated people living in urban. Now look, I don't want to erase any like urban, you know, working poor or um, college educated people living in rural areas. This is all approximations, but you can generally see that swing of an increase of 50% to Republicans, an increase of 63% amongst Democrats, and then the Metro Counties area is what blows me away, 71% to Dems. And this is something that we've been talking here a long time. I've had a lot of debates with people, which is like, what is the idea, you know, what does working class mean exactly? Like, you know, uh, for a lot of people in the media, they just want to say it means, you know, white men, and of course, like, there's a lot of working class people who live in cities as well. I am beginning to think that the diploma divide is really what it is, mm. which is that, you know, you could, there are people who have high status jobs who don't make that much money, but they're still not working class. And then it's the same thing where you can actually make a decent amount of money, say, as like in the trades, but for, culturally, you're not necessarily elite or anything else. So generally, that diploma divide, something I'm going to be looking at a lot in the next four years because I think it's the chief divide in American politics now. Well, and look, the story of this election is fundamentally pretty simple. Yeah. When you run the John Kasich campaign, mm -hmm. when you roll, run the vague, like, soul of the nation, platitude, norms and guardrails campaign, which is what Joe Biden did, 
they targeted their campaign at exactly this group, yes. at exactly this demographic. And we've been saying the whole time, look, this could work. There are enough there. And it and did. It, and it did. The numbers worked out for them because they're still holding on to a good percentage of working class black and Latino voters. Mm -hmm. And actually, one thing that is another story of this election is that um, Joe Biden decisively improved on Hillary Clinton's margins with young voters. He did a little bit better among seniors, yep. though not as much better yeah, as Trump was still predicted. still won seniors. Trump still won seniors. Still won seniors by three points, but it was closer than the last time. But the big edge um, that Biden gained on Clinton's performance was among young voters. Um, but yeah, look, this is a coalition that can win you elections. But what does that coalition look like in governance? And we're going to talk more about yeah. that through the show. We're going to talk more about that throughout Catholic. many shows and years, yes. I think, to come. Yes. But you're already getting a glimpse at what it means. It means that you're getting, you know, Pete Buttigieg, you're getting Susan Rice, mm -hmm. you're getting a very return to the Obama era type of approach to an administration, um, which is an era that was very comfortable for suburbanites with college degrees in this country. And you are continuing to ignore and allow fester the very problems that brought you Donald Trump in the first place, Boy. the very problems if you're the Democratic Party that brought you Bernie Sanders in the first place. And so when that is the group that you are centering your party on and relying on for votes and relying on to dictate what direction you take your policy in, that means a very specific thing in terms of what your governance is you going to look like. You couldn't be more right. And I said, I think I said this before the election, which is to the extent that Joe Biden will have a mandate for anything, he's going to have a mandate for one thing, which is a coronavirus vaccine and distributing it. And it turns yeah. out this morning, we just got the news from Pfizer that 90% of the in, of the people in their trial um, were having a success, had success in not getting the virus, yeah. which is fantastic news. I'm sure it Trump was is pretty, like, really? Yeah, Trump is probably. <laughs> the stock market is like through the roof right now. Zoom stock is 401k. Cracking. Are doing amazing, um, yeah, or everybody's 401ks are doing amazing. But think about this that's what a year, like maybe that they said third quarter 2021 by the time there's wide distribution of a vaccine. So, what do you do for the next three years? I mean, what does that look like? You got what a D plus six something majority in the house. It's we have some races which are uncalled, but it's very tight. What does it actually look like whenever it comes to governance? But I also want to say there are a lot of Republicans who are like doing dancing, you know, about the Zapata County, which I've talked about, and the increased Latino vote. Look, still lost. He lost the popular vote by a lot too. So there's only really one way, in my view, in order to get this thing done. You've got to win a lot more working class voters all across the spectrum. And that's got to change about how they govern themselves during this Biden administration. And all things considered, all signs point to a total return on both sides to the 2012 politics which I think is a disaster for the country. And I think that, again, it's something that we have to really learn our lessons and look deep into this data about which messages resonated with whom and see who we can win if you ever want to win an election again. And same thing for the Democrats. This was a risky strategy. It came within 150,000 votes across four different states to win this election. Barely 150K votes. Trump, if Trump wore a goddamn mask, he'd be president of the United States right now. True. He didn't even have to do anything else. If he just wore a mask in, like, March, and maybe if he passed a stimulus check, he'd be the president right I now. And people need to grapple with that. 100% right. If yeah. COVID didn't come yeah. along and rescue the Democrats, they would have still been all running on their impeachment and Ukraine gate and all the crap that they've been doing that yes. didn't work at all, yes. that people thoroughly rejected. Um, yes, they made gains in the midterms because their side was more energized than the Republican side. But you can see clearly Trump turned out his people, right? And more. And more, <laughs> yeah. right? Trump did turn out his people and more, and you narrowly scraped by. But to your point about the return to the 2012 politics, look, the most likely situation here is that neither party becomes the party of the working yeah, class, that you maintain the sort of racial working class divide that has been endemic to American politics forever. That is the most likely direction, but it's not inevitable. It's possible. We wait till 2023. That's that's what we really wait for. Is yeah. that Republican primary 2023? And I mean, who the hell knows what's going to happen with Joe On Biden. the Democratic and side. And Kamala or whomever. I mean, look, anything could happen. It's going to be At this point, I'm not even going to try and speculate on that one. I do want to, yeah. um, last yeah. thought here, Nina Turner had, I thought, a really excellent op-ed in the mm -hmm. Washington Post that we should check out. And she said, to your point about 2012, a return to normalcy is simply a circuitous route back to Trumpism, yep. which is a way of saying, look, you don't deal with these underlying issues of inequality, of all the gains going to the top, 
of people feeling deeply unsettled about the future for themselves and their communities and their children, you're going to end up right back in the ugly place that you didn't want to be. I completely agree with that. All right, we're going to tell you what's on our radar. That's next.